words from today's introit from Psalm 118, verse 1. Beati maculati in via, qui ambulat in lege domini. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And then the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear Reverend Father, dear brothers, dear sisters, dear faithful, I'd like to speak to you about my brother. He's one of those special souls which has been blessed since his birth. And I think the Psalm 118 describes him perfectly. Blessed are the day who walk, whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. When he was seven, 14 years old, he had the strong desire to dedicate his life to God. And so he listed him himself with, or at least attempted, to join the Capuchin monks, these Franciscans. And unfortunately, he was rejected, rejected due to his ill health uh, and frailty. But he did not, did not let this rejection deter him, him from dedicating his whole life to our Lord. He was not depressed or cast down by this rejection. In fact, he made him even more hungry to give himself entirely to our Lord. When he was 23 years old, in 1749, the Redemptress came to his village. The village was called Muro Lucano, and south of Naples in Italy. And the Redemptress came to preach a mission. St. Jared, my brother, St. Jared Magella, he attended these missions and was so taken by the missions that he knew this is my vocation. 23 years, years old, he had this rejection some years beforehand, but at this point in time, there was the will of God for him. He knew exactly the way he needed to go. He needed to join the Redemptress. His mother feared this, so she locked him in his room, waiting for the missionaries to leave. What does St. Jared do? He tied up all his bed sheets and made his makeshift rope, threw it at the window, climbed down and joined the Redemptress. He left a note for his mother and the note read, I'm going to become a saint. My brother, St. Jared, not only became a saint, he became a, a great saint and a wonder worker. He was quite young when he died, 29. He was born in 1726 and he died October 16, 17. 55 at the age of 29 years old. His whole life was full of miracles, not only in his religious life, but also in his life as a layman. And if you were to read his life, you would think you're reading a, a fantasy book or a comic book, a DC or Marvel comic book on some superhero. The life of St. Jared, you, you read his life, these are just episodes of his life. He levitated in the air, flying around. One day he became invisible. He great, had a great love for the poor, that he multiplied food constantly. He had infused knowledge from God that he astounded the, the greatest theologians of his time. He could read hearts of people and reveal the sins to them. But I think his greatest power was his perfect obedience. He was the perfect religious. The most amazing miracle, though, was that he walked on water in the Bay of Naples, has been attested by many, uh, by many witnesses and is one of the miracles attributed to his condemnation. He walked on water, saved the sinking ship and brought it back into land. So in Jared is one of those unique saints when he was born basically as a saint. And at the age of five, unusual blessings were showered upon his family. One day this, he came home with a loaf of bread and his parents inquired, where did you get this loaf of bread? And he said, a beautiful little boy gave it to me. And so this, this happened time and time again. And they were quite disturbed by it because they knew that he was such a holy young kid. So he was five years old. He used to go to church every, every day to pray to the Madonna. And then one fine day, he started to, to return with a loaf of bread. So they knew that the son would not lie because he's quite a holy young kid. But they had, didn't know how to further approach the matter. So St. Jared's sister, he was one of five children, she decided she was a no-nonsense kind of person. She decided to follow him and to see where he got this, this loaf of bread. She wasn't convinced of her little brother's answer, even though she knew he was quite, he was quite a holy. So lo and behold, she followed him to the church, hid behind pillars, and she saw him do his daily routine. He knelt not before the statue of Our Lady, holding the infant Jesus. And something astounding happened. The ordinary became the extraordinary. The infant Jesus 
came alive, went, came down from the hands of our blessed mother, and he, he played with St. Jared for a little while. And after they had played and prayed, the infant Jesus gave St. Jared a loaf of bread. And off St. Jared, he went off home and said, this is my, here's my loaf, a loaf of bread. St. Jared's life was full of miracles. But his only ambition really was to be like Jesus Christ, to join Jesus Christ in his sufferings and in his humiliations. And his holiness was based on his determination to be a, a perfect image of our Lord's suffer or, or Jesus crucified. And despite all the constant miracles throughout his life, as a child, as a teenager, as a religious, he had many crosses to bear. And one of the greatest crosses that he had to bear was being falsely accused and calumniated for inappropriate behavior with a woman. And the, later, the woman later admitted the charge was a lie. But at that time, he did, not, he did not deny the accusation. And so the superiors were, weren't quite sure what was going on. Obviously, this is this um, spirit of, of suspicion. So they, they put St. Jared under surveillance and they basically restricted him from Holy Communion for several months. And if you know St. Jared and you've read his life, this is, probably was his greatest martyrdom not to receive Holy Communion for several months. When all was done and dusted, and St. Jerry was sent into the office of St. Francis, who was the rector major at that time, St. Francis asked him, why, why did you not say that this, these accusations were false? And his answer was that he thought that patience was required in the face of such unjust accusations. The St. Jerry bore this colony with such humility and patience that St. Francis said that hey, brother Jared is a saint. Consequently, St. Jared is one of the patron saints of those who are falsely accused. St. Jared is also the patron saint of expected mothers. In his last recorded miracle, it's credited to this, this scene where he was speaking to a young lady one, one day and he inadvertently dropped his handkerchief and on his way back to the monastery and she grabbed the, the handkerchief and went to return it to him. And St. Jared said, no, I went, you will need it, you keep it, you will need it someday. Fast forward, he died. She is this young lady, got married, she's pregnant. And she went into labor unexpectedly, quite early. And then she was on the verge of losing her baby and she called for St. Jerry's handkerchief. And she, it was applied to her. And lo and behold, both her and the wee baby were completely, or the, the pain and the, uh, the the verge of death was completely subsided, taken away. St. Jared was not a priest, he was a religious brother. And being a brother is a great vocation and one that is overlooked these days. It is the vocation of the unsung heroes of the church. And in recent history, one of the greatest tragedies really of the church and to society happened after the Second Vatican Council. Particularly in the 70s and 80s, we saw a, lo a loss of tens of thousands of religious brothers and sisters gone literally overnight. These prayer warriors gone, these powerhouses of prayer empty. Why did these men and women become religious? In the life of St. John Bosco, a secular priest was thinking about joining his order. And he said to St. John Bosco, obviously in, in a nice way, I would like to join you to help as much as I can. Don Bosco's reply was, no, God's work needs no help from men. You come simply for the good of your soul. This is the reason why men and women become religious brothers and sisters. They join religious life for the good of their souls. And consequently, they, through the dedication to God, they help others to help them, them for the good of their souls. And looking back, before the 70s and 80s and before the Second American Council, we noticed that, for those who are old enough to, to remember, that the brothers and sisters were the ones who held up the fabric of Christian society and Christian values. Brothers and sisters were the ones who, who nurtured culture. And we see the lack of the brothers and sisters uh, in our society today. There were some who were active, some who were contemplative, they were ubiquitous, they, they, were some, they were taught, they were in, in hospitals, they, they helped, helped, uh, helped orphans, 
the poor, the sick, men, women, all, all classes of society. They're all helped by brothers, religious brothers and sisters. And most importantly, though, their prayers supported the church. Tomorrow is the Feast of St. Jared, and we celebrate St. Jared, my brother. He is the patron of the brothers of the Congregation of Most Holy Redeemer. And it's a day where we show our appreciation for our brothers, these courageous souls. A holy archbishop once said, and this is true, well, I believe it's true, that every vocation in our times is a miracle. So we're blessed to have in our chaplaincy religious vocation, both brothers and sisters. And they have joined not to help out or make up the numbers. They have joined religious life to, for the good of their souls. And like St. Jared, the, who wrote that note to his mother all those years ago, they have joined to become saints. So may our Holy Mother inspire all of us to become saints. My brother, St. Jared, pray for us all. And then the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.